Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this virtual event. Uh, I am thrilled to bring together Book Passage um, and some of the best independents on the West Coast, Powell's Third Place Books, Book Soup, and Rake Straw Books, um, to present this event with Eleanor Cadden, uh, joined by Justin Torres. Um, we are so thrilled to produce events like these. For you know, 47 years, we've been bringing together authors uh, and readers and sort of giving access um, to creators in this way, and we are thrilled that you can join us and be part of it. Uh, and I encourage you to look on our site so you can see a whole archive of similar events like this. Um, this book is so, so, so good. Um, it is a thriller and a character-driven study that dives equally into psychology and kind of the contemporary issues of our time, and I think that is so rare. Uh, I won't say too much because I'm going to turn this over to uh, the esteemed editor, Jenna Johnson from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Um, we are so pleased to have all three of you here today, and I'll let you take it away and introduce our authors. Thank you, Avram, and thank you to Book Passage, Book Soup, Powell's, Rakestra, and Third Place for hosting this event. I'm here today to introduce our honored guests, Eleanor Catton and Justin Torres. I'm wildly honored and daily delighted to be their editor. Yes, I am the editor for both of them, which means I am a very, very lucky human. Eleanor Catton is the author of the international bestseller, The Luminaries, winner of the Man Booker Prize and a Governor General's, Liter Governor General's Literary Award. Her debut novel, The Rehearsal, won the Betty Trask Award and received nods from the Guardian First Book Award, the Dylan Thomas Prize and the Orange Prize. She is also the screenwriter of Emma, a 2020 feature film adaptation of Jane Austen's novel. Born in Canada and raised in New Zealand, she now lives in Cambridge, England. Justin Torres is the author of We the Animals, which won the VCU Cabell First Novelist Award, was translated into 15 languages, and was adapted into a feature film. He was, a he was named a National Book Foundation 535, a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford, a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard and a Coleman Center fellow at the New York Public Library. His short fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, Granta, Tin House, and The Washington Post. He lives in Los Angeles and teaches at UCLA. One of the great joys of being a reader is seeing themes arise and recur in an author's work. And of course, one of the unique delights of being an editor is hearing an author work through how those themes will develop, what choices they make to hear how they really think. For Burnham Wood, as many of the reviews have noted, Eleanor was seriously focused on plot, but she said something quite revolutionary about it, which was that one of her aims in this book was to remind us that talk, that conversation is plot, that words have consequences, create actions and reactions, and can move the story and the book forward. And here I am extrapolating my own hopeful interpretation, maybe conversation can move the world forward too. Justin's forthcoming book, Blackouts, which we'll publish in, on October 10th, mark your calendars and pre-order as soon as you like, is also centered on talk. The conversation between two characters drives the story and the storytelling of the novel. You should also know that Justin and Eleanor are old friends. They met at the Iowa Writers Workshop, where we can safely assume they found a lot to talk about. <laughs> so we're clearly in for a treat, eavesdropping on two old friends, to literary lions, or perhaps to Justin's preference, hyenas. <laughs> Let's hear them talk and see what happens next. Thanks so much, Jenna. Thank um, you. I'm really happy to be talking to you about this book, Ellie. Uh, we are old friends, and I've been waiting for this next book <laughs> along with the rest of the world. Um, I loved it. I found it really thrilling and really challenging as well um, about kind of some ideas that I held and it made me think about the way I think the way I, my mm. own blind spots because I feel like so much of the book is about paying attention to blind spots 
Um, but we'll get into all of that. First, I think the best thing is just to hear the work in your own words. So do you want to give us a reading? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, I only wish we were in the room together. Oh. <laughs> it's the one bittersweet thing about this. <laughs> Otherwise, very happy event. Um, I just wanted to set up, I'm, I was going to read a passage from the book that's quite late in, in the action, and I wanted to set it up by um, talking about a, uh, or telling you about a real life um, thing that happened in New Zealand politics in about 2011, that the, the government of the day um, mooted a proposal to, rapid, uh, to radically expand mining operations into the country's national parks. And in order to kind of shore up the case for, for, for doing this, they undertook what they called a stock take of the country's mineral resources that lay on conservation land. And so they poured quite a bit of money into um, pricing up the value of these, these minerals. Um, of course, it was a, a highly dubious exercise, because how can you possibly price up the value of, 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 of minerals? How, how can you possibly factor in all of the things that you're losing and um, harming by, by seeking to extract them? But in my book, um, I, I kind of run with, the, with that idea. I take that real world event and kind of imagine a different future consequence for it, I suppose. And so that, that sets up um, what I'm going to read. Uh, so this is in the point of view of one of the, the novel's um, younger characters, whose name is Tony Gallo. And he's, um, he's a, well, he's, he's kind of a self-important Marxist, as you will hear. <laughs> He, he sat shivering, still soaking wet, still breathing hard, his pulse still throbbing in his neck. The government's proposal had not been scrapped at all. They hadn't caved in the, in the face of public pressure. They hadn't respected peaceful protests. They hadn't capitulated to the public mood. They had simply begun mining the country's national parks in secret, against the will of the people, without the knowledge of the people, illegally, immorally, without environmental oversight or oversight of any kind, and given the aut autonomo connection in collusion with a foreign company to boot. It was a theft of historic proportions. It was conspiracy and corruption at the highest level. It was an offense against democracy. It was the gravest conspiracy, the most shocking lie, the most egregious rape of nature and abuse of power in the entire history of his country. It was treason, treason, Tony repeated dumbly in his mind, thinking how antique and even fanciful it seemed. He was so staggered that he started to laugh but his laughter subsided almost at once, and in its place he felt a wave of fury and despair roll over him at the sheer inexorability of late capitalist degradation, not just of the environment, not just of civic institutions, not just of intellectual and political ideals, but worse, of his own expectations, of what he even felt was possible anymore. A familiar surge of grief and helpless rage at the reckless, wasteful, soulless, narcissistic, barren selfishness of the present day, and at his own political irrelevance and impotence, and at the utter shamelessness with which his natural inheritance, his future, had been either sold or laid to waste by his parents' generation, trapping him in a perpetual adolescence that was further heightened by the infantilizing unreality of the internet as it encroached upon and colonized real life real life, Tony thought with bitter air quotes, for late capitalism would admit nothing real beyond the logic of late capitalism itself, having declared self-interest the only universal and profit motive the only absolute and deriding everything that did not serve its ends as either a contemptible weakness or a fantasy. Then that subsided too, and he was left trembling, heart pounding, chest brimming with a feeling that was very like euphoria. Aloud, he said, Jesus Christ, and then again, Jesus Christ, and then hushed in wonderment, he said, I am going to be so fucking famous. <laughs> I love, love, love that. I love that moment in the book. I love, I love that swerve um, between this kind of, you know, very, very kind of prescient analysis of what's going on and what's wrong, and then this swerve into this individual motive, which I think is something that, <laughs> that happens with a lot of the characters. Um, but maybe we should do a little bit more of just setting up of the book, and maybe, maybe an entry way into that is just talking about 
the title first? Um, oh, sure, yeah. Why? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So in the book, the um, the title is, it, it refers to a group of guerrilla gardeners who go by the name of Burnham Wood. Um, and they've, they've called themselves that because they see themselves very much um, in opposition to the Macbeths of the world. They see themselves very much on the right side of, um, of the kind of political um, questions of the day. Um, they, they go around the South Island of New Zealand where the book is set and plant edible gardens, uh, sustainable gardens in neglected spaces, sometimes asking permission and sometimes trespassing and um, engaging in vandalism and even theft. Um, and when the book begins, they have reached a kind of an impasse as an organization. They they have to decide, as many left-wing organizations do at, at a certain point, whether they're going to stay true to their anti-capitalist principles um, and risk extinction, or whether they're going to compromise on those principles and join the kind of economy as we know it. Um, and there are, there are kind of different camps within the organization that feel feel a little bit differently about about that question, which it kind of sets up the book. Um, but to talk about Burnham Wood more th thematically, I suppose, or kind of more um, uh, genealogically, um, of course, it comes from Macbeth. It's uh, mm. one of the later prophecies that Macbeth goes back to the witches um, and, and receives, uh, which is that uh, the, the witches tell him he will never be vanquished until um, Burnham Wood, a forest near um, where he lives, comes to the castle of Dunsinane, which is um, which is his castle. And so he hears this prophecy and takes it, um, as he does all of the prophecies in the play, as a statement of certainty. He takes it as a statement of impossibility because he thinks, well, okay, forests can't move, so so therefore I am safe. You must be finding a clever way just to say that this that I will never be defeated though of course um as we all know that um the invading army ends up using the branches of of Burnham Wood as camouflage and so in, in, in that way the wood the wood does come to move um and so I was I was interested I mean I, would, I love that you began by talking about blind spots because I because that was that was very much at the heart of what I was kind of wanting to explore with this book um the kind of the blindness that arises out of certainty when we when we have an idea of a, a kind of a conviction that we are very much in the right or a conviction especially about the future that we we know how things are going to turn out um or we believe people who are telling us that they know how things are going to turn out that there's a, a kind of blindness always arises out of that out of that certainty there's a there's a rigidity to certainty um that 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 I mean for Macbeth that that is his downfall, mm -hmm. and um, and so in in approaching that, we're in, in this novel, my the kind of my the, the the first formal idea I had for the book came out of feeling a, a kind of a general feeling I suppose I think probably most people in the world were feeling in around about two thousand and sixteen with all of the massive kind of political upheavals that were happening around that that time um the election of Donald Trump the Brexit vote mm -hmm. just this this kind of sudden sense that we were in totally unprecedented political territory and all of the the things that we'd always taken to be true up until that point would no longer serve us mm -hmm. in kind of facing down this future that was suddenly rushing at us very very fast and kind of very alarmingly um and I was around about this time. I was I was just noticing among I mean in myself and also among kind of people around me how it it, it seemed to me that everybody could agree that we were all hopelessly polarized mm -hmm. and that this and polarized that polarization was a bad thing, but nobody would then follow that up by saying and the person who needs to change is me. <laughs> Everybody, no matter what you believed, was saying polarization's bad. We're all polarized, and and it's the other people's fault. You know, <laughs> the the blame kind of lies elsewhere. Um, and so, out of that came this kind of formal idea for the novel, where I thought, okay, well, maybe what I can do is try and design a novel in multiple points of view, where the the, the novel would in, inhabit different consciousnesses in. That, that that would be um, characters of different generations, of different political persuasions, 
um, who, who would kind of have different agendas, but who would all nevertheless have one thing in common, which is that none of them would think that they were the Macbeth of the book. <laughs> so they would all think that the Macbeth of the book was someone else. But my, my, my ambition was that if I, if I designed it well enough, the reader could make the case that any one of the characters was the real Macbeth of the book. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in a way, they, they, they're all kind of vying for that, 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 that villain status. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I kept switching. I was like, oh, I know who Macbeth is. Oh, I kept switching myself. And it was enjoy. It was enjoyable to watch, to, to experience that, to feel kind of secure in your understanding of a character and then be like, oh, oh, you're, you're the hubristic one, right? Like, <laughs> and, then it, and then it's everybody. I was also really enjoying looking for the witches. Like, um, oh, cool. yeah. like when they're doing the puzzle, there's this moment when they're doing a puzzle of like three puppies. It's like, it's a pivotal <laughs> moment in the book. And I'm like, are the three puppies the witches? <laughs> uh, yeah, but, of that, but I love it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but your answer, there's so many things in your answer that I want to kind of go further into. One of them is um, you kind of describe this, this moment when these kind of liberal institutions seem to fail us and and polarization, the way we think of polarization is this kind of vertical split between left and right. And one of the things that your book does is talk a lot about inter intergenerational divides, mm -hmm. right? That actually like, there's another way of looking at the way in which we are polarized and pulled apart from one yeah. another. And it's, and it's much more about what the boomers have done to the X, to Generation X. Well, I'm, a, X I'm, a, I'm generation a millennial. Three. We love we love to talk about the boomers. <laughs> <laughs> it's our favorite topic of conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and that really, that really, um, I don't know. It, it seemed like I've seen this described as like an eco thriller, an eco feminist thriller, and some hmm. the bigger conflicts. It seems not to me about like man versus nature, but but much more about generations and class as yeah. well. A lot about class. Yeah. yeah, I find I find the kind of the way that injustice is being borne out intergenerationally, I find it so difficult to know how to feel about it actually, because of course the one the one thing that none of us can control is when we're born. You know, that's it, it's totally without it's totally beyond our control. Mm -hmm. Um and so there's this way that um talking about into uh, about generations is kind of having a certain character and having a certain relationship to one another is is almost immediately frustrating because you're you're dealing with things you're, you're dealing with an aspect of people's lives that they that, that they're, they're kind of helpless <laughs> to change in, in, in a funny kind of way um but I, I think that I that seeing the 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 I I, I think that because the novel I wanted it to be a satire about property about our obsession with property this is I mean particularly true in New Zealand where um you know there's just such an kind of a, a obsequious uh, fawning over the, the kind of millionaires and billionaires who come into the country seeking to buy up tracts of land where they are going to then see out the, the this apocalypse that they're presumably inflicting on the rest of us <laughs> and that there's just such there's a such kind of toadying relationship to that in, in New Zealand They've, New Zealand's just been um unbelievably hospitable to these um to these people while at the same time you know young younger people are absolutely priced out of 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 ever owning a home of their own there are there are families living in cars and in garages and in tents and just you know like it's it it the, the the injustice of it is just so shocking and um in, in New Zealand in particular it, it def, that injustice definitely plays out along intergenerational lines you know if you if you were lucky enough to be, have been born in the 1940s 50s or 60s you you are probably property rich by now and if you're unlucky enough to have been born after that then you're probably property poor and that it's I don't know I just I I, I think that a country has a responsibility to its citizens that that kind of goes far beyond you know the kind of hollow ideas about gdp you know mm -hmm. yeah um i want to talk the other thing in in that initial answer that i wanted to talk about was in regards to macbeth was um genre 
right tragedy like like why I mean what you're the conflicts you're talking about are so intractable and and they're so I mean and and the little bit that you read in the beginning like it all it all feels very overwhelming and so the tragic seems like a, a natural form but Shakespearean tragedy especially is like bloody right it's like it's like <laughs> really tragic and your your book like you know it's it's it goes places um I'll say, <laughs> that, that's all I'll say um but why tragedy like why why that form what do you think it teaches us um or like like why did you reach for not just a thriller but a, but a tragic thriller I think because I was interested in irony, um, a, a lot of the kind of the, the the other very big influence that hangs over this book is Jane Austen's Emma, which I adapted for the screen a few years ago, and I was reading it and rereading it at the time when the first idea for Burnham would have occurred to me. So, kind of my appreciation and love for that novel ended up kind of giving me this model for for, for, for what I wanted to do in my own work. Um, and I, I, I had started to see Jane Austen around that time as as having this relationship with Shakespearean comedy that, that I kind of saw her as carrying on the tradition of of Shakespearean comedy, but perfecting it within a novel form. And and so I wanted to see if I could do the same thing, you know, begin in a satirical mode in the way that that Emma does as a, as a novel. But rather than bending that satire towards a, a, a formally comic ending, as, as Jane Austen does, I, I, I wanted to see if I could do the same, but then bend it towards tragedy instead. Um, but I was just, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about irony and what, what, what a kind of a life lived on social media or a life kind of mediated constantly through sc screens, what that does to irony. Um, and it seems to me that, um, that, 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 that for all of human history, there's been a, this very, very critical distinction between irony and hypocrisy. So in, uh, irony, there is contradiction in irony, but it's a contradiction that's not denied. It's, it's a contradiction that's kind of acknowledged and embraced and it's, it's human and it's funny and it's, and it's, and it is tragic often. And it, you know, it's, it's kind of the, it, it 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 lives in its in its contradictory um, um, spaces. You know the the space between what you expected and what really happened, or what you what it always always happened and what did happen this time. You know, um, whereas hypocrisy also has to do with contradiction, but it it's a contradiction that the the hypocrite seeks to deny. So so a hypocrite is somebody who who's who says one thing and does another, and they they don't like you to call attention <laughs> to that difference, you know. Um, and I, so I was thinking about this difference and thinking about how on the internet, so if you're on Twitter, for example, there, there kind of is no distinction between irony and hypocrisy because there's no difference online between saying something and doing it. There's no, there, there's no difference between you know, like s saying that you stand in solidarity with somebody online is standing in solidarity insofar as that platform will permit you to stand. I don't know, in insofar as you can understand what standing really means. And so I think that online we've we we've lost a sense of contradictions being able to live in in in, in a very human and kind of deeply ironic way. Um, well, everything is fake online and so there's this there's this kind of flattening everything is surface everything is you know there's there, there, there's no sense that something and its opposite can be can be kind of true at the same time um and so I want I, I was thinking about that and I, I I wanted very much for the book to follow dramatic dramatically ironic arcs in in the in the case of all of its um all of its characters so like Tony for example who's um who, who was the point of view of in, in the passage that I read out um he arguably by the end of the book for all his proselytizing and his kind of political passion his final action in the book is the most destructive of of anybody and in a way he kind of does he does almost the worst thing I can't I kind of 
yeah, I wouldn't, I don't want to spoil it, but he is, he's, he's, he ends up being more destructive than, than, than anybody else. And so kind of getting the characters to a place where you could kind of, you could see how somebody could become their opposite was very interesting to me politically, I suppose, because I think that it, it, I, irony just seems so important for us to contemplate all the time, especially in our political leaders, you know, it's when, when people deny the contradictions in themselves and rather than saying I am a conflicted human being and I have a head and a heart and I have loyalties that sometimes intersect and sometimes are in conflict with one another you know um instead they you know if a person says I am a good person I am on the side of right I you know everything that I do is automatically you know commendable or everything I do is untouchable you know that's when we get into these really kind of dark places, these kind of dehumanizing places. Um, this is a, quite a rambly answer. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great answer. And it's got me thinking about, it's got me thinking about um, villains, right? Villains being the only ones who kind of escape this trap, right? It's like one of the things in the book is that people believe themselves to be doing good without really interrogating whether or not what they're doing is motivated more by self-interest than it is by do-gooding, right? Right, that's interesting. Um, and the, a villain escapes that problem, right? The villain's like, I want to I want to do bad. Uh, and everything serves that purpose. Um, I'm curious about including, like, I'm curious about villains and including a villain, like a classic villain in a story. Um, what were you thinking about that? I was just wanted to have a bit of fun, actually. To be honest, <laughs> probably not a very interesting answer there. Um, it was quite. It was actually quite late in the book that I made the decision to um, enter Lemoyne. So, so, so Robert Lemoyne, the billionaire, is a. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned him yet, but he's there. There's a billionaire in the book, Robert Lemoyne, who is a drone manufacturer and has come to New Zealand in order, ostensibly, in order to build a, a survivalist bunker in the country. Though he has. Kind of more nefarious um uh things that he's the, that he's doing um and it was quite late in the book where I kind of really settled into his point of view and realized that if I was truly going to kind of luxuriate in his kind of highly psychopathic um <laughs> kind of point of view there would be a there would be a way that he he would just kind of present his plans to the reader with with relish, you know, mm -hmm. that he would just kind of let you in on what he was, on what was going on because he had, I mean, why not? I mean, he he think he thinks that he's, you know, he ha he has no moral compass, so mm -hmm. he's 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 just thrilled with himself for, you know, <laughs> for being able to do what he can do, and that 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 would kind of result in a this kind of swaggery kind of monologue and kind of style in, in, in his, in his point of view. Um, yeah. I mean, it, I, it's, it, it's funny. I've, 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 I was very influenced actually by a, a book on story structure that's called into the woods. Um, that's really for more for screenwriting though. I think it has kind of implications for, for, for dramatic writing mm -hmm. in general. And one of the things that the author John York says in that book is that, he's talking about paradise lost and he's talking about the question of likability and how writers sometimes kind of lose a lot of sleep over how likable their characters are and he says it's just such a rubbish question don't even think about it you don't like satan in in paradise lost you love him mm -hmm. and that's actually really important that you we love villains because they in, in many ways they are acting out what we desperately wish that we could be we could be acting out in this even in this you know highly destructive and kind of even masochistic way that there's this element of wish fulfillment mm -hmm. in inhabiting but then inhabiting them and then also seeing them defeated um that 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 speaks to something quite deep inside of us um yeah so I, he was he was a really fun character to write to be sure <laughs> yeah, they, yeah 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 no I, I mean I think that the the comparison to Satan in, in Paradise Lost yeah it's a good one because there's there's some there's something seductive in in this representation right and um even though yeah it is it is 
villainy and evil. But but bringing up a book about screenwriting makes me wonder why the novel, right? What is why is this a novel? Why isn't this? Because you you do screenwriting, like why not other mediums? Like what is it about the novel that that you think is important for telling the story? I think it it has to do with morality, actually. Um, that I I believe that that the novel is so crucial to our moral understanding, um, and that that kind of and more more generally, I would say that I think that fiction is fictions of any kind even in the form of a little thought experiment you know what if what if that was you instead of him that what if that was her instead of him um fiction is critical i think to our moral understanding i think that we 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 need fiction in order to be able to rehearse in our minds the consequences that issue from our moral actions mm -hmm. and what 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 fiction can do is it can present us with consequences because it's time bound it's it's happening in time it can connect actions to their consequences in a way that for us the readers is kind of consequence free because of, of course it's just made up so it's like you know people don't really have to die for the book to for, for, for the book to get written but you can still explore what what happens kind of how, how these how the effects of our actions that ripple outward and I think that the great advantage that fiction has over the screen is that it can really put you inside the thinking the the mind of another person even the body of another person the breath of another person um you know there's this kind of elasticity in fiction with respect to both time and space that 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 within a paragraph you can dip into somebody's memories you can shape it according to their perception of the world you can you can note you can you can notice what they notice and nothing more which is which is slightly different on on screen I think I mean you can you can you can do that on screen you can direct the gaze and you can perform acts of misdirection but I I just think that the the situating of somebody the reader within somebody else, the character mm. and the or the, and the narrator, for that matter, is is just so much more supple and complex um, in in fiction. And so it's more and more I kind of believe that it, it is the moral art, art form, and that you know as as we go more and more on screen, I do I do worry that that that's kind of symptomatic of a kind of a moral decline. Um, yeah, yeah. One one of the books that I've I, I read recently while while writing this was a book by Michael Sandel called The Tyranny of Merit, which is kind of a um, a, a book about meritocracy and um, you know qu quite critical of meritocracy and and where it's led us. And early on in the book, he um, quotes the speech that Obama made, I think about um, ten or fifteen years ago, where when he was president, where he says something like. Um, I can't remember what he was talking about, but he says something like, this isn't about doing the right thing or the wrong thing. This is about doing the smart thing. Mm -hmm. And it's because it, it, it's in the context of a chapter where Sandel is talking about the kind of ubiquity of the word smart in our cultures. We have smartphones and smart cities and smart fridges and smart everything, it seems. Um, but he, by isolating this, this speech of Obama's, he points out just how chilling it is this idea that there could be this category of of smart that supersedes the moral that that d don't worry you do, we don't need to think about right or wrong because there's there's now this third category that's that, that where computers live you know that they it's it's fine and soon all we we will all elevate to this category too you know yeah. if, if we're only smart enough and it i mean it he points out in the book that this is not so different from Donald Trump saying several years later I don't pay taxes and that makes me smart I mean he's even using the exact same word it's the exact same formulation it's that there's there's right or wrong and then there's and then there's the the kind of the business of computers that we're all kind of aspiring to um and I I, I find that very chilling and I I, I now see that I, I just see it more and more after having read that book that there's this there's this kind of sense that we can 
we can transcend what is messy and mu muddy and um, just complicated and emotional and kind of rooted about human interaction and 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 exist in this plane that 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 kind of lies above that. Um, and I just want to kind of shout when I hear that. I want to say, no, we can't. You know, if we did yeah. that, we would stop being human beings. You know, it, it, there is no, there is no moral. Everything, everything is moral, and we need we need to be articulate and and kind of nuanced and mature in the way that we we deal with these problems, rather than believing that we can sidestep them. Um, because I think that you know, great horrors rush in yeah. when that happens. Yeah. I mean, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking of Lemoyne, right? I'm thinking of of billionaires and drones and I'm thinking of tech. I'm thinking of, you know, this desire to sidestep the world, sidestep the messiness of life, to isolate yourself, to kind of silo yourself, surround yourself by wealth, or to kind of float above humanity, right? <laughs> These drones yeah, yeah. That, that see everything. And um yeah. Yeah, I mean the the there I mean, you can think of quite a few billionaires in the world who are, have made no secret of their wish to escape Earth. You know, they are. <laughs> they, they, what they're fleeing is is morality. They're fleeing responsibility. They they want to create new societies where they can just they they can be free from the pressures of of, of right or wrong. They can just be smart. You know, and I and I I'm I'm troubled by how complicit we all are in that kind of thinking. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do, I kind of feel more and more actually that the novel can bring us back, you yeah. know. And one of the ways that I think you do that in the novel, you, you have this small riff, right? So there's, there's Shelley and Mira who are two of the most important characters in the novel. And they're both these young activists, part of this Burnham Wood collective, and they are, you know, they're, they're frenemies. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's an antagonism. There's a lot of love and respect there's also antagonism between the two of them um and they have this kind of seemingly trivial conversation about apologizing versus saying thank you and you know there's a little riff on that in the book and it got me thinking about morality and it got me thinking about repair right like how do people have grievances like there are a lot of grievances there's a lot of rightful grievances that people have about the way the world works the way it's been structured the way that they're being dispossessed um mm -hmm. and then people have minor petty grievances that they weaponize there's another character in the book amber right who's really good at weaponizing her grievances in this very i don't know gen z millennial way whatever right like um <laughs> and what is the response like to both legitimate and illegitimate grievance, right? And I was thinking about apologizing versus saying thank you. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, a that's question a good question. Um, well, I, th I just think that, you know, any kind of hopeful and radical vision of the world has to trust in people's ability to change. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of a lot of the em the emphasis on apology or on uh, kind of writing historical wrongs doesn't fully trust in that. I think that that it is it's kind of it, it maybe wants to settle scores and maybe total in a totally justified, you know, <laughs> settle away kind of you know um, uh, kind of way. Um, but I think that you know a, a proper a, 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 a proper restoration would be more than just getting back to where you started it would more it would be more than it, it, it would be a rebuilding it would be a replanting you know um and I, I I suppose I kind of as a general comment I kind of look out at the world and I just see I I, I see so little faith in the kind of people's human power to change I think that there's this there's a um there's kind of this prevailing sense that that actually we're all just hopelessly polarized and selfish and and kind of self-interested and that there's no there's no kind of nobody believes that people can change anymore nobody believes in change or in kind of you know the power of youth and the power of creativity and 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 then the power of connection um, and I think 
so much of that just comes from how we think about money that mm -hmm. that you know there's these kind of top-down structures of people just so wanting to hold on to their property and hold on to their hold on to their assets <laughs> and kind of shield them from everybody else that there isn't there isn't kind of that sense of mutual I don't know ins inspiration or or you know um yeah I, I mean I, I don't I, I, I don't feel pessimistic about the world I actually feel I I I think that human beings are really amazing and we need to we need to kind of reflect on that <laughs> and realize that you know we can get out of this mess that we're in we're just I don't know I just I think that we're all kind of aspiring to be computers and I just don't understand it yeah it's occurring to me that like we've been talking for a while now and one might get the impression that this is a book that is just like pure philosophy like two people <laughs> sitting in a room just like talking about the state of the world and it's actually a thriller like a page turning gripping thriller that is full of thought um and so I just like put that out there and then maybe ask you about plot there was a yeah. big feature in the New Yorker where it was like Eleanor Catton is here to rescue plot and like, like thank god for Eleanor Catton's abilities with plot and mechanics and I agree like I think I think I, I can't do plot at all I, I'm amazed at your ability to do plot so I'm wondering if you have if you want to talk a little bit about about plot about its importance yeah yeah well I think that you know, um, a, a a novel that hinges on actions. Characters make a mistake. They mistake somebody else's intentions. They they don't fully communicate their feelings. They you know say one thing when they they mean another. They advocate badly for themselves. I think that what what a plot that well what, what a novel that is plotted in that way kind of implicitly says or tacitly says is that that action matters because if any of those little blunders along the way or those little plot events along the way had turned out any differently then the ending would have been averted you know in this case the tragic ending would have been averted but it, it's true in a comic sense as well um and so I think that there's there's this way that a plotlessness can be in certain situations a kind of an abdication of I don't know maybe responsibility is the wrong word but a kind of a a, a sense of apathy it, it, it can or, or a sense of nihilism a sense that that actually it doesn't really matter what happens because these people are going to be the same you know whatever happens to them and there's a sense of kind of reaction being the, the 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 kind of the province of of um the literary novel that everyone kind of just kind of drifts around and 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 kind of reacts to things <laughs> rather than makes plans and kind of wants to wants to kind of bring bring things about you know but I think I think that there's just something so deeply humanistic actually about about plot you know it's it's it, it's a it is it's creative on the level of character because the characters are wanting to create a, a future for themselves you know and they're they're coming into to contact with one another and you know um they're finding their agendas are misaligned and so on um but i i i i i think it comes back to this moral question this that this kind of conviction that I have that the, the novel is fundamentally at its best when it is um well maybe I shouldn't say at its best but it, it is uniquely equipped to to talk about moral questions in a way that that allows you to explore intentions actions consequences in a way that we we need to be able to explore those fictionally in order to be able to make better choices ourselves in the real world um you know, it's it's so interesting whenever you're talking about um, just moral questions that, that 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 face the world. How often we use words that are borrowed or or characters that are borrowed from fictions. Mm. They, they they kind of become our 
the, they're our playground. You know, that's that. that they're, they're they're models that we that we use because we we know what it's like to be Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, and so then that he's he becomes an idea that then we can we we can talk about in a way that's so much easier to talk about than to talk about miserliness mm -hmm. or loneliness or, or 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 whatever it is because you you feel you 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 both feel what it's like to be him but also feel very passionately that you don't want to be him <laughs> and that, and so in a way there's a there's there's a kind of an emotional component to it that allows you to explore the issues so much more deeply mm -hmm. than you could if um you know you're just kind of talking this arid way like one of the things i mean i'm not i'm not much of a marxist i must, much must confess um i mean i don't really know much about marxism really but um the one thing that has always really bothered me about that the famous phrase um to each accord uh, uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need is that it sound on the surface it sounds amazing you think oh brilliant what a well designed society like sign me up there's you know nobody will go wanting you know but then you think about it a little more and you think has this person does he know what how abilities are formed does he know how needs present themselves you know like, there isn't an easy match between these things people often only discover what their abilities are you know in 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 times of great challenge people often have needs that that don't match up to any ab ability you know there's a there, there's this kind of emotional poverty to it that is so that it, it kind of drops out of the out of the equation because it's it's just this kind of nice intellectual presentation that that doesn't deal with the 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 question of how to how to organize a society as a novel would you know in a way that is rooted in character and um you know able to live in the ironies the kind of the deep ironies that are the the basis of, of human life i think yeah 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 i mean i think when you when you what i hear you saying is like embodying like actually embodying putting into bodies the these abstract concepts like greed or whatever they are um, that something else different happens there are there are questions coming into the chat so i, I feel like i should ask them um i think we've reached that time <laughs> the first question is a, a about chat GPT, which I wonder if this is written by a human or a chatbot. We're <laughs> uh, <laughs> <I'm> being trolled. <laughs> the question is, do you think chat BT and artificial intelligence in general could eventually eliminate the need and purpose of humans in our quest for morality and human connection? Or are you more hopeful? <laughs> well, I don't think, is there a need for humans? I feel like that's a I don't know what I would how I would respond to that. I I find chat GBT just so infuriating. <laughs> I don't know. I find it such an infuriating topic. I just wish that, <laughs> that our incredible human ingenuity was being directed in a different way. I don't I just don't understand why why this is <laughs> this is where we're putting our energies, quite frankly. Um I, I can't believe it'll ever be satisfying, you know, to interact with a machine. There was a very good article by um, um in the New York Times recently about um probability and how um it was it Noam Chomsky um wrote about AI in the New York Times and about how um actually great kind of scientific breakthroughs and great works of art are not satisfying to us kind of, they don't appeal to us because they are or they're not even true because they are statistically probable it's actually the opposite it's that they are so improbable and yet that, that they are true and that that's that's a kind of a sophistication that a a machine based on probabilities is just never going to is never going to achieve that those kind of leaps of insight and understanding um yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm not I've, I'm not very excited by it, I suppose. I'm excited by human beings. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's being a professor in the university. It's, it's, 
fascinating to think about the way it's going to impact uh, learning and education. But uh, Patty asks, I enjoyed the book a lot. However, I didn't walk away with hopefulness as there was no character with a moral compass I could lean on to be hopeful. Did you intend it that way? Oh, I think that, I, I, I would say that I feel differently about that. I think that, that they all have aspects of their kind of moral um, kind of selves that, that I admire and that I think that in a different, in, under different conditions could have, could have um, been used in different ways. Um, I didn't, I didn't want the book to flatter anyone put political point of view. I didn't want the, any, any one person to emerge as the hero of the book because I, that was, that, that, that was kind of part of my whole project with the book. I wanted, um, I wanted the book to explore a kind of a deep complicity and a, a, a this kind of tendency we have to um, scapegoat our political enemies um, in, in a kind of an even-handed way. Um, but that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I still make the case that it is, it is a hopeful book, which I know is, it probably, it probably seems a bit strange if you've read it, but I, th I think that it didn't have to be that way, you know, like it doesn't, yes yeah yeah, yeah. All, all of the all of the um the blunders of the plot the kind of misdirections miscommunications that that lead up to this catastrophic ending they they all rest on very very kind of humble foundations you know they're, they're all just failures of communication mm -hmm. if, if any one of the characters had just been more open with the people around them in 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 various you know context if they had just conversed a little more and and gotten over themselves a little more then that ending wouldn't have happened um and I feel that way about the world we live in you know that yeah. that that the, you know it's a, a better ending is is in our reach yeah I mean I would I would defend it <laughs> this way which is like that you also don't you like you don't go to Macbeth to be like <laughs> like for hope and a hopeful experience. And yet I think with with your book um, and with the tragic form in general, I think it is it is about um, potential, right? Like it is about potential that's been lost. I think that a lot of the characters in your book, what's very clear is that where they've ended up in, if, if they've ended up in a very polarized position or if they've ended up in a, in a kind of way of thinking that's shutting down other ways of thinking and a kind of certainty that's that's limiting it's because they began in hope right and so like what yeah. I get from the book is like how do you nourish that how do you return somebody to that that place of hopefulness before they got shut down before they became an ideologue right when because everybody becomes an ideologue or a fanatic because they really have a lot of hope and potential for change right like that's that's right. the starting place. And so I was thinking, I was meditating on that as I was, as I was reading this, like what was, oh. in, in the tragic form, what was the moment, right? Where you swerved from a kind of ambition for yourself in the world that was moral into something more limiting or whatever. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. I, I <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe that's it, unless there are more questions. Um, yeah, I had an absolute wonderful time seeing your face again and talking. This was really fun, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's funny just to bring it back to irony on your last point that um, I think one of the, the biggest things that I, I learned about irony, and it came partly through studying screenwriting, but also spending a lot of time with Jane Austen's work, is that... Um, is that the, the importance of that kind of second twist, that it's not just enough to, to ironize once, you have to then ironize that <laughs> a second time. You have to, you, you, you reverse and then you have to reverse the reversal. And that only then will a story feel kind of complete, you know, that you have to have that, it, it's the three acts really, you have to have two turns um, within, within any, in, any one journey. Um, and so in the in the case of Macbeth, you know, he he receives this prophecy, he's going to be king. 
the first thing he does is to go and kill the king, which is, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a brilliant response to this prophecy. He makes the prophecy come true. But then that, that idea of making the prophecy come true is then subverted in his downfall. That mm -hmm. it's because he now believes that the prophecy is something that is true and that that, that then becomes the blindness which which you know kind of the, 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 therein lies his fall at the end of the um at the end of the play so i think that thinking about that in in the context of human lives like that we that that, that things aren't just black and white things aren't just the right way and the wrong way the my friends and my enemies that there's this way that you know the the first ironic turn is to become your enemy <laughs> but then there's there actually is there's there's another part of that journey where actually that itself will will usher in yet another change you know and I think that this that kind of more sophisticated way of looking at mm -hmm. um, humanity which is ironic rather than kind of merely hypocritical um, can can give us a lot of hope actually for for, for the capacity to change you know the the we 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 don't have to see things in in these kind of narrow ways. We can we can take one step back. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. I mean, I could ask you a question about Iowa, but I don't know. If, I don't know if we want it on the internet forever. I'm going to ask you that question privately, which is <laughs> about some of these characters and this idea of these young people in their twenties and collectivity and sex and all that stuff and being up all of each other's business. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, yeah. I wasn't thinking about Iowa. Yeah. I, yeah when, I, I, when I wrote it, really, yeah. yeah I kept thinking about that. I, I kept thinking about like that time when like that that intense, um, yeah, we were all living so closely together and all paying so much attention. Yeah. The, well, the I, I, each other's I, I think I've, I've probably said this to you before, but the single most kind of revelatory night that we ever had at, at the Iowa Writers Workshop I don't know if you remember this but we were um in George's bar and I had just read read this um thing online that was a um it was a quiz and it said which do you value higher mercy or justice do you remember this <laughs> and, uh, we were anyway we we're sitting in a booth with another friend of ours and um, this question came up and you said, well, isn't that just a really stupid question because everybody in the world would say, and then you said mercy at the exact same time as I said justice. <laughs> and what, what ensued from this was this kind of hours long, tearful, kind of passionate argument about which of these two things was, was more valuable. And it was so amazing because we realized that depending on whether you saw yourself as the arbitrator or as the receiver of these things you kind of had very different attitudes and we were just kind of testing each other's theories and just kind of calling each other's names and that <laughs> that to me was the best the absolute best thing about grad school it's like being able to self-indulgently kind of passionately kind of drunkenly spend hours on this kind of <laughs> slightly mm -hmm. ridiculous philosophical question and kind of end up feeling like you are bonded for life you know <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely it was great it was a great time and <laughs> and this was a great time it was great to revisit this uh, conversation 15 it was really time. fun thank you <laughs> justin eleanor thank you so much i think for everyone watching this is like a confirmation of the power power of literature, of, of, of hope for writing, hope for the world, how they're all kind of hand in hand. Um, and it was just wonderful listening to you both. Um, so I hope you all out there enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. I hope you go out there and get Burnham Wood, um, this fabulous novel. I think as Justin said, it is a total ripper. So you get a sense of the depth and the intensity of ideas and the sort of wonderful intellect going on in this book. But it's also one of those that you're just like, it's two in the morning and I've got to, you know, get up for work tomorrow and you are still reading it. So I really encourage you, go to your independent bookseller, first and foremost with Book Passage, Powell's Third Place Books, Book Soup, or Rake Straw, who brought us this wonderful event. 
Um, thank you, Jenna and FSG for putting this together. Um, but mostly, Eleanor and Justin, thank you so much for writing and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>